Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see so many faces of people who are in the documentary also in the crowd. Um, my name is Antonia Cerejido. I'm a host here at LAist, and I have the pleasure of moderating this wonderful panel. To my left is Scott McCulley, who's a co-publisher. Um, then we have Terry Akamatso, who is the editorial director at Angel City Press. Then Patty Calistro, another co-publisher. You all have seen their stories. And then uh, Richie Kolchar, who directed this film. So thank you so much for being here. Um, Richie, I wanted to start with you. How uh, did you get involved on this project? How did, how did Angel City Press enter your life? Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. Okay, so let's see. So we were approached by uh, KSET um, to pitch on a couple of different ideas. We kind of connected with the Angel City Press story, um, mostly because of our lack of familiarity with what they did. And we, you know, my, my, my partner, my business partner and I, um, Ben Boyd, who shot it and edited it, um, we were we're kind of interested in doing stories that we don't know anything about, right? So there's like some, there, there were stories there that we were like, okay, this is really interesting. <clears throat> and then this one was a great story. We're like, oh, we're not familiar with what they do. And then you start to get into some of the books and because you start to do a little bit of research and you're like, oh my God, these books are cool. And so it, it was it was born out of a lack of familiarity with it that immediately became kind of like a really quick obsession with the work and then how it impacted, you know, LA because overall our interest in LA is just like how vast and, and I mean, it was said in the film, how incredibly vast it is and full of stories it is and never ending those stories are. So that's how it started. Well, Patty and Scott, I feel like you've had, you have this whole body of work made up of looking at other bodies of work. What was it like to be on the other side uh, of this process? Yeah, having your story being told. Well, you know, it was just horrifying. <laughs> we we didn't know what these wonderful filmmakers were going to do with our lives. And so until we saw the film, we were pretty nervous. But they made it so easy along the way. And we we all became friends. It was impossible not to. And then we saw the film, and we sighed this huge sigh of relief. Immediately called them and told, told them how much we Thank loved God. it. Thank <laughs> God. I was like, I have no idea what they're going to think of this. I hope they like it. <laughs> so it, it was an experience. Scott had some ideas about that. I won't that. talk to you about the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> you won't talk about the spreadsheet? <laughs> they're good. <laughs> Um, and then, Richie, I just learned that you are you make you normally do commercial work, and so this was like the longest thing you had ever worked on. Like, what was the biggest change for you in working in a long format? Yeah, that that was a big um, part of the experience. You know, uh, Ben um, has a lot of experience in documentaries. I actually got my start in commercials doing docu style commercials. So like, they were AccuView commercials where they literally brought people in and they would real people who needed um, contact lenses and they would put on the contact lenses on camera and like get this real experience. And so I just fancied myself like a, a documentary, whatever, right? Like I, I, I really just did commercials for years. And so, um, but I lived in a world of, you know, 30 second increments, uh, a minute, you know, as you get into some of the web stuff. And so some of these longer stories that we tell for brands max out at like three, five minutes. Some of them are like eight minutes long. Um, and this is an hour and this was, I mean, it was, there was a learning curve for sure. And it was just, it was so cool because I like pieces that are this length more than feature length, uh, documentaries, depending on the subject, just cause it's really fascinating to me. I really like short stories, novellas. And so, you know, it was, it, it was overwhelming at first and then quickly became a lot of fun and then incredibly overwhelming again, because it was like all this content and four hours of interviews on each person and, and then it became fun again. And so it, it was, it was, it was really cool. It was a cool experience. I really, I love how the documentary looks and I, I like the play between the books and the visuals in the film. I think there's a really, I think it, it's a challenge, an artistic challenge to take books and then put it into a film. And so I think I thought that was really successful. I'm curious what the thinking behind that was. 
Uh, you, like how to shoot it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we wanted it to feel very homey. We wanted it to feel as authentic as not only the people who create these incredible books, but the authors and the subject matter they're talking about. It's all very intimate, right? Terry's process is very intimate. The books themselves are like really intimate exposés on all these topics. And so a lot of these shots, you can see they're, they're, they're pretty deep macro shots. They're very close up. And because, I mean, you open these books and you kind of want to live inside of them. You know, you flip through the book and you're like, my God, these, this is so cool. And so a lot of the shot choices where we wanted... Um, it, on, on the close-ups, not only for it to be just so close, like you're right up in the book, but then also show the family of books. So it's just kind of juxtapose that with the really wider shots of just all the piles of books and everything like that. And um, the books themselves are such dynamic and strong pieces of art that, you know, we have all these ways as filmmakers that we could like make stuff look cool and like shoot it and then step motion, you know, stop motion and do all this stuff. And we went through all these ideas and we were like, none of that is going to honor what these books are. In fact, it'll just be even more complicated and it won't let the book sit there and be experienced. And so we reverted all the way back to like slow, um, intricate moments with, with the books, in, intimate moments with the books. Yeah, I, uh, speaking of the books, um, I, I was curious to learn a little bit more about the transition from journalism into doing books. Like, what sparked that, the desire to start a publishing company? Well, I guess I should take that one. Yeah. Um, I, I was a journalist for many years, and I got out of it because I hated my boss. <laughs> <laughs> And I had a baby, so that was a good excuse. And I did a book with a co-author about Los Angeles. And it was at the time that style books were selling really well. Um, a Santa Fe style, Manhattan style. So we, Betty Goodwin, my co-author, and I decided to do a book that was on Los Angeles style. But we didn't want it to be quite so trite because we were both journalists. We weren't just making beautiful books. Um, so we started looking at what really makes Los Angeles. What are the aspects of it that make it a unique city? And we came up with seven, I, I think, criteria. And photographed it, had a wonderful photographer, Greg Crawford, who really loved Los Angeles as well. And we took it to a New York publisher and they bought it and they had a designer on staff who we never met, who took all the photos into his possession, took all the text into his possession, and then presented us with our book. We had no say in what it looked like. It looked fine, in fact. The publisher at Viking told us it was the most beautiful book they'd ever produced. And we thought, ooh, and we started seeing dollar signs. And then when it went out for sale, I ran to every bookstore, and it wasn't there. <laughs> and I thought, shoot, what is going on here? So I called the publisher. And I said, you know, I went to Dutton's books, and I went to Rizzoli books, and our, our bookstore, and our books weren't there. And he said, well, you know, this is why publishing doesn't happen so much in Los Angeles, because nobody reads in Los Angeles. Well, I had just read that per capita, Los Angeles sold more books than any other city in the United States. So that so was. There you go. That was, yeah. yeah. And it turned out that the salespeople didn't like to sell things about Los Angeles. So that was about the time that my husband, who was a tech guy, started talking about desktop publishing. And I said to Scott, you know, oh, and so. <laughs> They ended up selling 5,000 copies of LA Inside Out, which was, you know, now I look back and I think, ah, that was pretty good. But we were expecting 35,000. 
And so I said, you know, we could sell 5,000 copies of a book with our hands tied behind our back. And that's how we started the company, with two other people who eventually got tired of working. Because once you become a publisher, it is a 24-hour-a-day job. And so we stuck it out. Yeah. Scott, do you want to add to that? Mm, the, I, the, only that the, I think there's a big parallel between having a book publishing company and having a restaurant, which is that people love this meal. And then you got to do the dishes, and you got to pay the rent, and you got to deal with the health department, and all that kind of stuff. And that, it's just a thing you do. But the product is fantastic. And when you build a clientele, it, it's great. That, that's really it. I let him deal with the health department. <laughs> <laughs> I like in the film when they talk about the mom and pop uh, feel. And even talking to you uh, backstage, I was like, wow, there's like a real warmth to the two of you that does feel very mom and pop. And I'm curious how much you think that has to do with your success. And Terry, I'd love your take on that as well. Why don't, why don't you give it a take on that? I mean, I think it's everything that makes Angel City Press so special. I say in the film, you know, when I came as an intern, I was 19 or 20 years old and how taken I was with the experience. But, you know, I also worked at other companies. I've worked in academic publishing for about 10 years and I hated my job there because I hated my boss and it was a miserable place to work. And we weren't respectful of our authors because it was a giant corporation that was just looking to make money. And so coming to work with Patty and Scott, where our authors are our family, we care about them, we want them to be happy with our books. We don't just hand them a fully designed book and say, hope you like it. I mean, it's what makes me love my job every day and get up and keep grinding through the photo credits and the indexes and all of that stuff. It's um, the secret sauce of Angel City Press. <laughs> our kids hate Angel City Press <laughs> <laughs> because it took mom and pop away from them a lot of times. Yeah. But our daughter ended up going into publishing. She works for another publisher up in San Francisco. But our son, uh, now nah, he's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I'm very curious about is the, pub the pitch process or like how you select the books that you do. Um, is it a consistent thing? Is it changed a little? Like over the years, how, what's the pitch process been like? Well, we've always, um, required that an author do a book proposal. And that can be anywhere from, you know, 10 really great pages to 100 pages. Or sometimes an author will come to us with a, with a fully completed book and they'll have an expectation that their book is going to look just like that. I think Frances kind of alluded to that when she had her gonzo approach to a book and her photographs. And, it, you know, it doesn't work that way. We then um, meet with the author and we see how serious they are, what their expectations are. And then we have our little meeting where we discuss all the content, the cost, the, um, the author, and we decide, can we work with that person? You know, because mm -hmm. it is such an intimate process. You have to be able to work closely with an author, and you have to be able to argue with them respectfully and listen to their arguments. And listening, I, I noticed in the film that I said we listen to people a lot, and I, that wasn't purposeful. But it really is true. I, I really want to hear what the author wants, it, it expects from his book or her book. And sometimes we misread that. There, there have been times. But yeah. Most of our writers, our, our authors, love us. What, what about Galactic Headquarters? <laughs> that didn't make it into the film. So part of the process that, that, that they told me that they do, that Scott and Patty do, is when they bring an author wants to come in and pitch them a book, they'll sit down and they'll tentatively bring them into the couch area, which is like the initial living room, which you would think would be like the warm family area, but it's really just like the screening area for authors. They don't really know them, they're kind of getting to know them. And then if they like what they're putting forward, 
the next meeting they'll bring them to what they call galactic headquarters, which is the kitchen table. Because <laughs> oh. the kitchen tables where all like the major business gets done. And uh, that's the table that you saw a lot of those shots with, you know, when, when you met Taj and Ben for the first time. And I just thought that was so funny. It was one of the first things I learned when I walked into your home. You were like, this is the living room and then this is galactic headquarters. <laughs> it was really so interesting. Funny. It's also our corporate dining room. And yeah. when I worked in the office, Patty used to make me a fried egg for breakfast every single morning. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that's important to know. It's part of the family experience you get at Angel City Press. Yeah, that, that's where it all happens. That's that's wild to think about all the like just how prolific and how much how, how much material you guys have. have created in that space just the three of you I just think it's really cool you know we've never had an office it made absolutely no sense to us to rent a place because we have a relatively big house we had two kids so you know there's four bedrooms there's a lot of room so we've never spent money on office space it just seemed like a waste and then we became quite trendy when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Yeah, you're ahead of the curve. It's, it's yeah. all abstention being cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, where's the new galactic headquarters going to be now that they're retiring? I think I'm going to continue to work in Glendale, the jewel city, and um, continue to work out of my house with an office in the library for meeting with authors. I'm not going to bring authors into my kitchen table until they've really passed the test. You've got to master the fried eggs, too. Yeah, I haven't quite mastered the fried egg. <laughs> Have you retired or? No. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. We're, we're still working. But it will be our retirement. It, I can't talk about it, though. I, I can't talk about retiring yet. You know, you do something for 32 years and love it. It's, it's a very hard transition to make. But thank God for Terry been trying to I have been trying Patty too Patty's better at it than I but you know to move away from the day-to-day -day process you know, we four years ago now three years ago we moved two trailer loads of books that were stored at a warehouse in, in downtown LA to our publisher publisher partner publishing partner distribution distribution partner Gib Smith in, in uh, Salt Lake City and they we now it was and that was in anticipation of the library, because we knew the library was not going to ship books out of their garage, which we had been doing for 20 years. And that has worked out great, but it, that doesn't, those are the books that go to the paying customers, the book, bookstores, the, all the Amazons and Barnes and Nobles and the independent stores and gift stores. But the books that go out for promotion, we still do ourselves. It's still out of our garage. I'm still doing that. And the books that are, that are ordered online, we do that. And it's... It's an interesting thing to contemplate not doing that because after I got used to shipping books, knowing exactly how much, in, in, like internally, how much sold. It'd be like being the only cook in a restaurant. Yeah. Like, you know how much, how much, how many, how many of that you bought, and when it was time to do this, and like, oh, we should, you know, we should reprint this. Like, no, it's not moving fast enough. You know, we're not going to reprint it. But now we have to actually look at numbers that come weekly from the distributor. And it's a little more disconnected. And so the next shift is going to be more than just handing over the, you know, the, the, the quote-unquote corporate assets. And the physical assets are just going to be, you know, the distributor will be used by the library. It's the same as, as we have now. But it'll be, like, much more about this day-to-day -day process stuff. Because that's not Terry's job. And so somebody's going to pick that up. So we shall see. It'll, the library will do what it what it's going to do. Now, what, what are the, for, for customers and for authors, like now that it's under the library, what mm -hmm. does that mean for them? Is there any change? Shouldn't I be. mean, it's my hope that nothing changes for our authors. I'll still be their main point of contact, and I hope the experience for them stays exactly the same. We're trying to insulate them a little bit from some of the bureaucracy of the city. Um, you know, for customers also, they, the customers don't interact with us. They don't know us as Angel City Press. They're buying their books from the bookstore or from Amazon or something like that. So I don't think anybody's life is really going to change except for mine, because instead of talking to Patty and Scott all day, I'll be reporting into the library and things like that. But yeah, I really hope that the authors feel like the experience is exactly the same for them. That's cool. That's yeah, that's really like, when did that idea come to be? 
who had that genius idea? Genius. Um, we belong to a publishers group, about 40 or 50 publishers who are small publishers um, meet once a year in the Western states. And one year, the keynote speaker was from the Library of Congress. And she was talking about how book publishers come to them to access their uh, photo collections and all the things that they have in the various museums there. And I thought, gosh, that's kind of what we did with LA Public Library when we did Josh Kuhn's three books. They were, each one was based on a special collection at the library. And so I thought, hmm, maybe when Scott and I retire, we should convince John Szabo, the city librarian, that the city library needs a book publishing company. And we laughed about it. <laughs> but I couldn't let it go. I'd wake up in the middle of the night rehearsing what I would say to him. But one day, I just picked up the phone and I called him. And I said, I'd, I'd like to have lunch with you, John. And I'd like to talk to you about something important. He said, sure, Patty, let's have lunch. And I just said, Scott and I really want to retire. And we don't want to sell the company for the reasons that we spoke about in the, in the video. Um, and so how would you like to have Angel City Press. And I just kind of held my breath. I had no idea. And he said, I think that's fabulous. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's great. And so that's how it happened. It was like the inverse of you've got mail or something. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's amazing. Um, OK, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up to, to questions. Um, I jo jokingly in the back, I was like, don't worry, I'm not going to grill, grill you. There is one thing that I wanted to bring up, which is what newspaper were you reading in the backyard? Because <laughs> uh, there's a part in this film that's where we're making fun of the New York Times. Yeah. I know, but I do read the New York <laughs> Times every morning. <laughs> and why isn't it printed out digital articles from LAist.com? <laughs> well, I, I do read LAist.com oh, every morning, and I read the Los Angeles Times every morning. And I read the Washington Post every morning, because I'm always looking for book ideas. And, but yes, I was reading the New York <laughs> no, I Times. I just thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was, I was like, ha. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you caught me. Well, you've got to catch them at, you know, you've got to catch them now and then. <laughs> the trouble now, though, is that when you read the newspaper that's printed, it's three days older than the new, same newspaper online. It's a whole different deal. Yeah, I'm online with the LA Times all day. You know, I, I see what's going on, but the print edition just got too lightweight for me. I was used to, uh, yeah. I was there during the wonderful days of the Chandlers, and there, things just kind of went downhill after that. I feel like that's not where we should end, but let's open it. <laughs> yeah. Now ask questions yes. about Angel City Press. Yeah, yes. No, we Can, won't talk about the infernal rag. You know, that. But could I ask, yes. uh, you know, a, a number of the people who were in the video or here, would you guys all stand up so we can thank you? Oh, that's you a good idea. We can see how many paying People customers like are here. Interview subjects. So we have Taj and Ben, Nikki, Francis, Carla Claren, Arthur Dong, Amy, 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 Amy. That's a good call, yeah. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Amy's back there, and she's so she's shy, hiding. and that's she okay. has been so important to the look and caring of our books and we are eternally and grateful. so cool to hang out with yes she is we yeah. have said more than 10 times that there are two types of art directors in the world those that introduce errors and amy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know art directors are very visual and 
they put pictures in places and text, but Amy reads. And she reads the book and she checks for facts and she knows as much as we do about everything that we're doing and we're just so very, very grateful to Amy. So even if she won't stand up, she's back there. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming with the microphone. I just wondered who made the incredibly difficult editorial decision about which of your wonderful writers and books to focus on in, in the documentary, and w are, are there e equally incredible scenes that are just kind of left on the table? Was it a question of availability, or just how were those judgments made? Right. I mean, what a great question. There, there are so many books that we could have chosen. In fact, one of the ones that we wanted to um, uh, highlight was, um, is it Brown Acres? Yeah. Yeah, about the L.A. Uh, city sewer system. But, and I can't remember, what's the name of the author who wrote that? Anna she, Sklar. Anna Sklar. And, and so we didn't get a chance to interview her, but um, I mean, that's just one of, there, there are so many books that are so incredible, and it became... You know, like it, it was, it was an embarrassment of riches, right? Like we, this thing can only be sixty minutes long. It can only have a certain kind of through line and a storyline. And so, um, we wanted to highlight books that talked about different areas of Los Angeles, um, and try our best not to leave a giant areas out. And I feel like no matter how you make that decision, no matter what you choose across, you know, five or six books over the course of a sixty-minute piece, you. You, there's going to be a lot of regrets. There's going to be a lot that you want to put in there and you just can't do it. And so this was a good example of just the number of people that we could have interviewed, the number of authors we could have highlighted. I mean, it was, it was, there, were, there were so many. And so, um, yeah, it was a tough decision. It was, it was a hard one. Terry, do you want to add to that? Um, well, obviously, we wanted every single one of our authors to be in this film. Yeah, we have a 300-hour cut. <laughs> just so yeah, you know, and so it's been a little bit awkward sometimes. To have, oh, this film is out. Your book's not in it. Um, so that was definitely all Richie. But one of the really big... <laughs> just to be clear. That's fine. Just blame it on me. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was all him. We really pushed for you. But one of the joys of doing this documentary is that it really coincided with the development of chaos theory. And so we were able to kind of film the whole process with Taj and Ben of doing the art and doing the design and you know looking at the proofs from the printer and stressing out about that holographic foil. Yep. So it really um, was able to show so much of what we go through in making a book with one author team. And that was a real joy. I just, oh, I just want to point out that Ben Caldwell um, is featured in another great Artbound documentary about the LA Rebellion, and he was here a couple weeks ago on this stage, and it's like an Artbound hero. So yeah, yeah it's cool. cool. That's awesome. <laughs> How did the foil come out? It came out? The foil came out pretty nice. Oh, the yeah. foil looks amazing. <laughs> it was absolutely true. It looks amazing. You have to check it out, everybody. So cool. And makes a great Christmas gift. Yes. <laughs> Hanukkah yeah. gift. <laughs> Whatever. Birthday gift. From, Nikki said from my store. Yeah. <laughs> from Octavia's oh, yeah. bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another question? Over here. Hi. Uh, in your discussion, you mentioned that, you know, with your first book, you sold 5,000 copies, and they considered it as well. No, with Angel City Press, how many copies do you need to sell before you consider it a success? It really depends on the book. Um, you know, we, we like to think we're going to be able to sell 5,000 copies of any book that we do. It doesn't always happen. Um, some books we sell 30,000 copies. but. I think if, if you can sell 5,000 copies, you can make a profit. We, we don't always make a profit. 
But. You know, but one of the things that I love so much about Angel City Press is that we don't count success by the number of books that we sell. And we've signed some books that we kind of knew weren't going to be big sellers. They're on really niche topics and there's not a huge market for them, but we know that they're important. We want to have them on our list. So we do them anyway. And they're still as successful to us as the books that really move a lot of units. It's truly just not about the numbers it's about you yeah. know what is this book saying about los angeles is it making a contribution are we proud to have our names on it and if that's the case then they're all successes and it, it yeah. sounds like nonsense yeah. and bs but it's absolutely true and that's why i like working here <laughs> this is you know th this is the giant challenge of commerce art and all that kind of stuff but it's layered in when you produce a physical product it's a thing it takes up space it costs money um, and you can't produce, it's like if you don't have enough left, if you don't have any, you can't sell them. And if you have too many, then you're made too many, but what are you going to do? And, but the whole point here is that there isn't any book that we have done that is going to be stale in six months. We did Rio LA in 2001, and it's, it, with 9-11, it's, it's premiere got truncated. And the book sold, sold, it sold, sold out, and it, kind of faded out. We didn't have books for a long time. And there's Rio LA revised vision, revised version that came out in 2020. And it sold out well. And it basically, it's the same book. It was re redesigned, but it, it, it's not a different book. It has a new afterword and that kind of thing. And then, but in terms of, it's not as if the old book, the original book is obsolete. And that's mm -hmm. 20 years later. And, the idea being that instead of having a six-week promotion season and a six-month sales season, which, friends, that's what your commercial publishers do, uh, it's more like you know six years. And then if you like, like for instance, so I know that we have 1,200 copies of Brown Acres in the warehouse. So if you like to get Brown Acres, you could, you could order a whole carton of Brown Acres, and it would, would be great. We'll get you a deal. <laughs> Hi. Um, what has been maybe the most heartwarming or proudest moment that you've had over the course of your time with Angel City Press? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> or just one of them. I thought of an answer to that question the other day, and now I've forgotten, and I'm completely speechless. <laughs> I think that watching that video <laughs> was really one of the most heartwarming moments for me because, you know, you're so involved every day doing a project and then doing the next project and doing the next one and you never get a chance to really enjoy each one. And so that, that was really very wonderful. And even tonight, now this is the fourth time I've watched it, I, I noticed something totally different. Um, oh, God. <laughs> we have an, one of our authors, Carla Claren, sitting over here. And when she sent me her book proposal, I knew her name. And I knew her name because I had seen one of her paintings, it, uh, she wrote L.A. Painter, which you saw many times. Um, and, and I knew her name. And her painting in another book that we had done was my favorite painting. And so I called her and I said, yeah, come on in. We want to see what you've got. And tonight, as we were watching, I realized that what I love so much about her paintings is that it, it captures LA in many, many different ways. Her paintings are, some people would call them abstract, some people would call them modernist. What would you call them, Carla? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like when you want to put labels on things, but in any event, as you saw on the cover of the book, if you recall, 
they're very impressionistic, not in the French sense. But I thought that's what I love about her paintings, is how it views LA. And that everybody that would look at one of her paintings would see a different LA. And I think that that's what we've tried to do with our books. You know, just, so that's, that's a heartwarming moment. I have to say that my most heartwarming moment at Angel City Press was the fact that I got married in Patty's backyard and Patty performed the ceremony. And um, it, was really, it was really beautiful and nice. And you would never think that you'd want your boss to marry you. But I couldn't think of anybody else whose um, statements I respect more. And I knew that if Patty told me that this is, you know, till death do you part, then I would really take that seriously. And I told her. <laughs> Because she married a wonderful guy, so. I don't think, one more question. Uh, thank you. My name's Ryan, I'm a fellow associate of Junk Films, Richie and Ben, and um, I think just being in this room, being here, getting to witness this film, and seeing all the people that were involved in how much heart and soul and passion is involved in the creation of such a project and then on display in this venue in this format it's just a treat to to be here and experience this but um aside from that i feel like the integrity in here is palpable in the soul of, of the city um but it's a two-part question so hopefully that's all right uh the first question is going to be for richie on the filmmaker side and ben uh from front to back green light to final delivery how long did this process take? And the next question is really for um, our publishing friends, kind of what with this digital world that we live in now, that ever-changing landscape of you know, what's to become of the book, um, this physical piece, this thing that we get to touch and hold will probably never change, but um, how do we get ahead of uh, a, a market or, or find success uh, financially? from a spreadsheet guy to another. Maybe you're the best one for it, but that's what I have. Thanks. Brett Ryan's a, an AD, so he's big in spreadsheets. You guys should chat up. <laughs> um, how, how long did it take? Uh, I think it took, what, six months? Yeah. Or something like that? We had a little bit less time. I believe like um, uh, the producers, um, Nick and Angela, and, and their team and with Marley, they were looking uh, to assign filmmakers to certain stories, and I, I think we ended up starting later than most people, so I think people have a little bit more time typically. Um, and so it was it was six months. I think we shot for 22 shoot days, which was a lot more than we intended. Um, but there was a lot, the story changed over time. The story started out, uh, let's do a story about the history of Angel City Press, and a little bit about um, how it connects to the community of Los Angeles. And then over time, we really decided that this story really is about um, all these authors and their love for the authors, and then how all of this reflects back to LA and, and, and vice versa. And anyway, so um, it felt like, yeah, six years. And it took six months. And it was, yeah, it was a wild experience. So it was pretty quick. It's a pretty fast timeline, I think, for, for a 60 minute piece. I think that what you just said was the most important thing because. You know, a publisher is only as good as its authors. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can make beautiful books, but if we don't have beautiful material to put into it, and that's what Scott and I were so pleased about when the film came out, when we saw it, because we thought, oh, God, what are they going to say about us for an hour? Yeah. But you talked about the books yeah. and the content of the books, and the authors were able to express themselves, and that's what it, we do. And loving and caring about the content of the books has made such a fulfilling life for us, and will continue to for you, you know. But, but that was the essence of what made it a great film, from my perspective. That's great, thank you, yeah. The second part of the question, I'll try to take it in and not talk a long time. The, 
business of publishing books, I don't think has ever been a particularly lucrative one. And some very famous authors have been self-publishers, Mark Twain, one of them, for instance, people you would never think that had to do that themselves, but they were some combination of cantankerous and contemptuous of the current state of the business, but they did what they did. This business of, oh, digital books, this, that, and the other, well, yes, and along the way, you know, we thought we were gonna be good students of this industry, so we would go to the book expo. The, you know, every, every year there's this, there was, it's no longer called that, and it's really no longer the same, but it was this professional, all the real publishers would go, and there's gonna be a big convention center, and they would deign to come to Los Angeles once every five years or so. And we'd go in and we'd hear a keynote speech about the, the coming digital revolution. 1994, 1995, 1996, next year, oh boy, if you're in the printing or the paper or whatever business, you better find another thing to do. And it's been a long time, it's just not the case. And we saw Amazon come and present the Kindle. And there were only 10 Kindles in LA and they were all in the hands of Amazon early employees, now billionaires probably. And they, we said, somebody in the audience said, well, how much are these, what are these going to cost? What's it going to cost the consumers? It's nine ninety nine. Says every book. Well, yeah, of course. Like, well, what do you mean, of course? There was no regard for what the content was and what effort it took to make the content and what was the market for the content. Because obviously, if you were some student of economics, you would say, if I have a very, very, very broad audience, I can have a lower price, or I can spend more money making the product, or some combination. And if I have a very narrow audience and the content is very valuable to them, I should charge more. No. And it turned out that that publisher or intermediary, and even though they were trying to disintermediate in other ways, didn't really get it. And there are just as many printed books sold as ever. And ebooks have been a layer on top, as have audiobooks and all that kind of thing. So that's just an, another medium. Are y'all on book talk? Kind of, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm a curmudgeon. No. Don't ask me about AI. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, we always tell our authors, don't give up your day job. All right, well thank you so much. Thank you for this beautiful film. And thank you.